very much. I think we have the microphone working now. That's great. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, even Tony, those who didn't have a whole lot else better to do today. That's good. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this will be worthwhile uh, when you get back. And um, as Phil said, I think I know um, most of you in the room, at least uh, I know of most of you, and I appreciate you being here today and hearing a little bit about uh, intermobility. Uh, that has emerged out of InnoVenture, uh, which I started about eight years ago. And uh, most of you or many of you in this room have been there and participated. Um, as it's evolved, it's all about discovering and developing high-impact business opportunities. So how can we identify the next big thing and how over time can we find the customer's capital talent or technology um, that helps it develop? And my son Gaines here is going to help me advance the slides um, today. So you want to click the next one? If, I, <clears throat> if you were at InnoVenture a few weeks ago, you heard Jessica Moss talk about InnoVenture. And, excuse me, talk about InnoMobility. And she, uh, she ended her presentation talking about uh, InnoMobility and beyond. And this is a really big idea. And everybody in here can benefit from participating in, in the global transformation of mobility. And it's interesting just listening to the introductions that we're here today. Uh, you know, we have Bill and Co Coyo Bearings and, and, you know, interested in kind of the mechanical aspects of this. And then we have Infor and Bob and mobile applications. And as vehicles become uh, more electric, uh, whether that is electric energy driven vehicles or just the electronics of, in the vehicles, um, that will begin to change the form factor and the function of what build, uh, vehicles are, which will change the mechanical requirements of, of those vehicles. So this is all going to get tied together. Uh, at InnoVenture last year, we, when it was over, last year being 2010, when it was over we looked at four different areas where we thought we could uh, uh, focus on a global market uh, here. And it was mobility, energy, materials, and connectivity. And what we realized is that mobility was a place where we had great strength here. And those other three, connectivity, materials, and energy, were all enabling um, technologies in driving mobility markets. So everyone here can benefit from this. It's a really big opportunity. And by the time we get through, I hope you find a way to connect with us and, and help us together uh, go um, do some pretty significant things. Well, so it's showing it on there, but it's not a little, uh, you know what? Technology's great when it works, Phil. <laughs> what, while, they're tr while they're doing that, what that chart is, is that is a chart of the growth of vehicles in the world. Um, if you go back about... Um, uh, 1950, there were about 50 million vehicles worldwide. Today, there's almost 800 million vehicles. And within about 20 years, there's going to be a, a, a 1.6 billion vehicles worldwide. You have the world developing around us and, and just driving the demand for all kinds of vehicles. To, to put that in scale, that is, um, uh, vehicles are about a $15 trillion industry right now. So if they double in the next 20 years, um, that's adding another $15 trillion or about a $30 trillion industry just in vehicles. Well, $15 trillion is about the size of the United States. So we're talking about growing an opportunity that's big as the United States economy today. Now, that's pretty significant. And uh, everybody can take advantage of that. Um, but intermobility is really more than just about vehicles itself. Um, it's about uh, creating a variety of mobility-related markets. So high-impact opportunities come at the intersection of evolving needs and advancing capabilities. So if you look around us at the kinds of needs uh, that are evolving, uh, there are demographic changes. You know, developing wor the, the developing world is becoming more middle class, driving the demand for vehicles. We're all getting older, you know, which is changing our use of vehicles. Societal expectations, we all are more connected today. 
Um, we, want to, we want our data to follow us around wherever we are, wherever we're going. Um, we expect high quality. You know, we, we've all just become, uh, it, we, we can have all kind of innovative products, but if they don't work, we just don't accept that very well. Regulatory requirements, um, uh, climate change and clean energy is just going to be a reality. You know, whether you believe in it or not, the, uh, the regulatory environment is going to impose a lot of that on, on mobility. Um, safety is a big issue. You can't introduce these kinds of products and not take safety into consideration. There's all kind of advancing capabilities. The vehicular design itself, um, CU ICAR is a graduate school built around um, an uh, a innovative type of vehicle design. Of course, you've got all kinds of connectivity, um, advances in energy. You know, right now, most of the transportation energy is petroleum based. And not that we're going to totally get away from that, but going forward, we're going to have a much more diversified portfolio of energy sources. Materials, stronger, lighter materials. We do a lot of work with Millikan, and one of the things they're interested in is how they can um, apply some of their performance materials to mobility applications. Environmental design, you know, the upstate um, forever talks a lot about creating more dense urban areas and metropolitan areas that make a lot more sense, more walkable communities. Uh, there's a movement away from the suburbs, you know, back into a more urban settings, and as gasoline goes to seven bucks a, a gallon and ten bucks a gallon and maybe more, that, that trend is going to uh, happen even more. And then transportation infrastructure. You know, it's going to get smarter, right? I mean, the connectivity is going to be on the interstate. We're going to maybe get some of our energy that way. Uh, so there's just all these advancing capabilities, and if you look at the intersection of those things, you'll find great opportunity, and that's what InnoMobility is all about. So let me give you an example. Uh, Tony Fidel had the idea of combining an MP3 player with online music. Okay? And what he did was he went to the uh, MP3 companies, and um, they weren't in the software business, so they didn't want to help him. And he went to the music companies, but they weren't in the hardware business, and so they didn't want to help him. So he went to Apple, and Steve Jobs saw that the combination of, of an MP3 player and online music created an entirely new market for personal portable music. And this is where the iPod came from and iTunes. And there's a couple of really important things about this little case study. One is the idea did not come from inside Apple. It came from the ecosystem that surrounded Apple. Um, so if you look at Milliken or Michelin or Sealed Air, they're all working with us and they're very interested in your ideas because they appreciate that you all see the world of different than they do, right? And so what we need to do is, 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 is bubble up the ideas out of this room, you know, around the major anchors here that have the resources to help us scale globally. The other thing important about this example there's nothing new invented here. All these parts and pieces previously existed. You know, what Tony Fidel did is combine them in a novel way. And often the most transformational business models are like that. It's taking parts and pieces of, of, of technology, of uh, customer service, of information technology, and combining them into a new model that creates an entirely new market. Um, so, we're looking for the iPods of mobility. This happens to be a concept, Smart Cities Group, which came out of MIT. And it's just an illustration of the way, you know, the, the, the form factor of vehicles might change. And you can imagine these vehicles being more connected, so there's information and technology embedded in them. You can imagine them driving on a whole different kind of infrastructure, being made of, out of different kinds of materials. You know, once a vehicle becomes electric, and most of these are electric, uh, uh, the car we have today is built around an, an, an internal combustion engine. That's the way it's shaped it is. It's got that big nose in it and an engine, and it's got a transmission right down the center. Right? Once that's not there anymore, then you're going to start to have things you know, morph in shape. So this, one of these vehicles in the middle, the front just lifts up, you sit down, pull the top back on you, and you drive it with a stick. Right? It's going to be much more like a, an airplane. Uh, than it actually is today's car. So we're going to see things start to morph pretty significantly. We are surrounded by a critical mass of world-class expertise and resources. 
This is the opportunity that we have in this region. Uh, Fred Payne is, is probably one of the leading public servants that gets this, that this is, a, this is an opportunity for us. So in Silicon Valley, you know, if, if you're going to do the next big web development company, maybe you go there, right? If you're going to do biotechnology, maybe you go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, or, or Raleigh, North Carolina. What we want to create here is if you're going to do the next transformational thing in mobility, you got to come here or you got to at least know who we are. Because we have such a critical mass of world-class expertise and resources that you have to engage with us I mean, if you're going to be successful. And we're not starting from scratch. You know, we have lots of expertise today that we can begin to build on. So we're looking for all kinds of people to participate with us in this community. Um, the vehicle designers and manufacturers, people providing materials and energy and information technologies, and organizations, you know, we tend to engage most with either the business developers looking for new markets or the technology scouts looking for new technologies. Of course, entrepreneurs who are creating the new businesses and the investors that are supporting them. Urban planners and architects that are starting to envision, you know, what the infrastructure will look like, you know, that will drive a lot of mobility. Faculties and students, uh, technology and service providers, and industry and economic development organizations. And I dare say that I probably cover just about everybody in this room. And if I didn't, let me know and we'll add you to the list. Because what's going to make this work is having a great diversity of people, diversity of perspectives, diversity of expertise, diversity of relationships. And that's where we're going to identify the next big transformational opportunity. We got about push, going towards 5,000 profiles online from conferences and forums we've done in the past. And we've asked people, what are you seeking? Right? When you come and you engage in InnoVenture or InnoMobility, what are you seeking? And in their own words, this is what people who have engaged with us say that they're looking for. They're looking for uh, new business opportunities. We took the text of what they said and we created this word cloud. So it's very you know, unambiguous why people engage with us. So if this is the kind of thing you're, you're looking for, we'd love to have you participate as well. <clears throat> we had InnoVenture about three weeks ago now. And one of the mornings was dedicated to InnoMobility. Um, and we had a major anchor, Michelin, who presented uh, what they were looking for. We had a, a series of opportunities that were presented around them. And then we had some conversations. And that attracted certain people in the audience. So in this case, Michelin said they were looking for a trial placement of the Michelin Twill. And if you're unfamiliar with that, that is a, a tire that flexes like a pneumatic tire but doesn't have any air in it. Um, could ultimately replace radial tires in the world. And so they were looking for a place to test this. Club Car is a subsidiary of Ingersoll Rand. And there was a lady in the audience from Ingersoll Rand that heard this presentation and connected Rod Bailey from Michelin with the appropriate person at, at Club Car. So that was an example of a connection that was made recently at InnoVenture. Another example is we had uh, Mike Rowan from Duke Energy that made a presentation. Duke is very interested, obviously, in electric vehicles and what the electric infrastructure is going to look like and the, and the requirements on the grid, and in particular the smart grid. And uh, someone who also presented was Star Electric Vehicles out in Simpsonville. And they connected as a result of this. And by the end of the day, Duke had gone on a tour of Star Electric's headquarters um, out in Simpsonville. So they, they really um, connected while they were there. So those are just two little illustrations of the kind of connections that we've already started making um, in this intermobility community that we're starting to put together. It's not just discovering opportunities, but it's watching them develop over, the, over time. And so those of you who have followed InnoVenture over time know that you've probably seen these three examples, because we talk about them a lot. Um, on the left is uh, Michael Bolick. Um, this literally came out of InnoVenture a few years ago. Uh, Clemson presented carbon dot technology. Michael was sitting in the audience, and I have a little snippet of video where he said he got so excited he looked around to see who else was taking notes. Right, right there, he started to connect the opportunity he only saw on the stage with the, with uh, expertise and relationships that he had. He came and presented the next year. He started a company, Sela Technologies, presented the next year, um, and said, "This is where I'm going. This is the vision I see. This is what I need to get there." 
This year he came and presented. He's now merged with Lab 21, which is a UK pharmaceutical company. And many of you may know that they're building one of the first personalized medicine laboratories in the country in the next innovation center downtown. I guarantee you, when Michael first presented years ago, there was nothing about personalized medicine in his presentation. He, that we, none of us could have seen how that was going to develop. Even he couldn't have seen how that was going to develop. That's the way this goes, right? It's kind of an incremental process. Um, in in, in um, some ways, it's, it's a, you know, a, a series of serendipitous connections that you make over time. And so, you know, we don't quite know when we start out on these journeys uh, where we're going to end up. Frank Greer's another example of where I remember when Frank was actually at Aronix. Um, he and his partners had previously spun out of NCR. Uh, they started Zip It, and you may remember that it was going to be a, a personal mess messenger that small children would use to text to their friends, right? Well, this year he comes and he presents, and they, and they have a national partnership with Verizon to reinvent paging for uh, mission-critical applications like hospitals, right? When Frank first presented, there was none of that, was there? I mean, there was none of that. I mean, he didn't see how that would evolve, and none of us could have either. So, uh, and then of course on the, on the right is Hawaii, um, and that, uh, I'm a partner with Ralph in Hawaii. He was at Michelin, uh, was working on a microstructure surface technology, uh, spun out, realized that that was a big market. Three years later, you know, our first commercial product is microstructured um, extrusion dies to, for, for piping and tubing. Now I've been in that conversation for three years and I'll guarantee you there was nothing about extrusion dies 36 months ago. So, so we want to not only discover opportunities like we did for Duke, like we did for Michelin Star Electric Vehicle, um, but we also want to watch these develop over time um, so we see what can be made of them. So that brings us to this question, and that is, what opportunities do you see? That's really what's important to us. I mean, what do you see that could develop that could be the next really big idea? that may develop here, but could be global in scope. And we're defining mobility very broadly, okay? And we're looking to help you take an opportunity you see. That could be something that's inside the existing organization that you have today. You know, it, it, could, be a, it could be a new opportunity in a big company. It could be a new opportunity on, in an independent company. It could, quite frankly, be an academic center. We don't really care, we're kind of agnostic as to the kind of entity these things develop in. Um, what, what they all have in common is they're really big, high impact kinds of opportunities. And so the people that participate in this to a large extent are like-minded um, individuals. Um, they're kindred spirits. They're all trying to do the next big thing. And while there's some differences based on the kind of an organization that they're in, quite frankly, they have much more in common in trying to increment their way uh, to, to a big idea than, than separates them. So uh, this Friday, we have a community forum coming up. It's from 9 to 11 at ICAR. Uh, we have the head of uh, innovation for Delphi. Uh, we'll, we'll be presenting online. Um, Delphi is one of the largest automotive component suppliers in the country. Uh, we have other forums coming up on, on July the 8th. August the 19th, we'd love for you to participate with us. Um, these are very short, they're, they're a couple of hours. We'll have a, a keynote speaker or two and then talk a little bit more about the development of our, of our community going forward. And then on uh, October the 18th and 19th, we want to have the first global conference in Greenville of Intermobility. And it'll look a lot like the format of InnoVenture if you've ever been there before, but this time we'll be focused on Intermobility itself and we'll begin to attract people from around the world, both live and online. And we, you know, we'd love to plant this uh, flag here and grow this over time until it really does grow into a very significant global event uh, right here. So, you know, are you seeking really game-changing business opportunities for yourself? You know, is this something that you would find attractive? Um, Alan Kay says the best way to predict the future is to create it, right? So what we are really looking for is people, is those proactive people, the Mickey Dorseys of the world who say, I see a really big idea 
and they put it out there, and they go to they go for true, um, pursue trying to create the you know the next big opportunity. So so if you've got an opportunity, or if you want to engage with those people who are trying to create game changing opportunities, we'd love to have you get involved. And so what are we looking for? You know how can you help us? Um, one we're looking for anchors to promote our priorities. So our entire program is built around the anchors that work with us. They put the marker on the horizon, they say these are the kinds of things that are important. So you'll see inside in a mobility, you'll see vehicle design, you'll see smart grids, maybe mechanical systems, um, mobile applications. Those priorities are created by the anchors themselves. Quite frankly, they provide most of the resources that makes this possible. So one of the things they get for providing the resources is they get to pick the targets. Uh, we're looking for champions to present opportunities. So we're looking for people to say, I've got the next big idea. Um, you can present that live at a conference. You can upload that um, at our community website so that you can connect with people online. And we're also looking for members to join and attend our events. So we have some forums coming up here over the summer. We have a conference in October. We'd love everybody here to participate in that. The forums themselves are free. They don't cost anything. There is a registration fee for the conference. Um, uh, you can, in, in, the, in the course of registering to attend the events, you put your own profile online and, and you join the community yourself. And so you can begin to connect with people. Other members of the community, you can connect with opportunities in the community. Today, there's about 250 people that already have a profile online. You can see who they are. You can connect with them directly, either through email or social media. Um, there are um, about 35 or so opportunities inside Intermobility right now today that you can go review and engage in. You know, between now and October, we expect that to expand considerably. Um, the, all of everything on the website is free, so you can participate in that um, and you know help us help us grow that community. So, you know, we'd love to talk to anybody who would like to help us as an anchor partner, or maybe has a referral to an anchor partner. Who, if you have an opportunity you'd like to present, we'd love to work with you on that. Or if you could help us identify, you know, those people that have really big ideas and encourage them to participate. And finally, we want everybody here to, in one way or another, participate in one of these activities, either live um, or online. So with that, I appreciate your attention. And Phil, I assume we have a moment or two for a question. Anybody got a thought or observation about what we're doing? Yes, sir. Well, you mentioned Verizon, who comes to mind is Zip it, right? And um, uh, so, so, you know, they're working very well. Um, in that case, um, uh, Verizon, there's five million pagers in the United States. And uh, there are some, they, they worked with Zip it and they really analyzed that market. And they said, where are there people who have problems, you know, with their pagers? And what they identified was mission critical applications like hospitals. And uh, the problem is you send out a code blue alarm to a doctor, I mean, somebody has a serious medical situation, and, and it was, it, it's not possible with a traditional pager to actually know whether the doctor got the message or not. Uh, so the first step of zip it is validation that the message was received. Uh, the second problem you have is that person may be in, been up at uh, Burger King, or that may, person may have been, you know, in the bowels of the hospital in this big masonry building, and so um, might not be able to reach it with kind of the traditional uh, Verizon network. So Zipit has a combination of the Verizon network as well as Wi-Fi. So you know it, it will find it the, however it needs to find it. It's also a much more proactive device in that um, if your pager is off, right, and it's a code blue alarm. I mean, it's a, it's a life and death emergency. It'll over, override all that. I mean, you can be in a meeting, it will deliver a page for you. Um, so it's a, it's a much more advanced paging system. It was designed to, to penetrate a specific market. And it is an example, I think, of your question of, of, a, um, of, a, of a large teleco working closely with, uh, 
with an entrepreneurial company here to develop a product not just for the local market, but something they can roll out nationally. Now that's something, if anybody has a challenge working with one of these big organizations, let us know that. Um, because, you know, all big organizations at the core, you know, have this operationally excellent core, you know, perfect quality, 100% on time delivery anywhere in the world. And that culture isn't always the most open in the world, is it? You know, I mean, and it's not the people in there, in the organizations don't get it. It's just that um, it's hard sometimes for big organizations to reach out and do the, the, new, the, do the next big thing. That's something we can help with. I mean, we have pretty strong relationships at most large organizations in the area with the kinds of people they're looking for, you know, new business opportunities, the next new thing. So if you're having a hard time, you know, bumping up against one of these large organizations, let us know, and we might be able to help you redirect and get to the right person um, who would be more receptive to what you want to present to them. Yes, sir. Oh, I think I think some of it's going to the growth is going to be what what we make of it. I mean, I, I don't know that anybody knows exactly what that's going to look like. And personally, I think it's going to be profoundly different than a lot of the vehicles we have today. I think a lot of that growth is occurring in in China and in India, uh, developing countries. Um, so you know, you've got between China and India, you have two and a half billion people who are rapidly becoming more affluent than they've been, and they're going to drive a demand for um, same kinds of things that we're interested in. And a lot of that's going to be a visit vehicle, right? I mean, one of those rites of passage is, you know, I, I got my own personal vehicle. So I think that's where a lot of that growth is coming from. That particular chart came from Michelin. Um, you know, I've heard them talk about that a lot. There's going to be 1.6 billion vehicles uh, a few years from now. Um, but, I, but I think we haven't yet begun to see how that's going to morph. Uh, you know, you start talking about really high impact opportunities, quite frankly, um, developing worlds may come up with things that look very different than what we have, right? I mean, some of the most advanced wireless systems in the world are actually deployed in third world countries. And the reason that they didn't have the legacy infrastructure to have to overcome, right? They, they didn't have landline phones, so they just put in the most advanced wireless network. My guess is that as mobility evolves, you're going to see that same phenomenon, right? You're going to see some of the, some of the most transformational infrastructure vehicles first maybe in developing countries because they don't have interstates and you know, existing electric grids. They're going to be able to do it uh, from scratch. Other thoughts? John. I don't know how much you remember about the Zeit group that was at InnoVenture. Yeah. But, uh, just comment about how that, as a new bicycle type product, might be a part of Inno, of Inno Mobility. Um, Zeit is a, uh, a a new kind of bicycle. Instead of you know turning it with pedals, you actually pump it like a stair stepper, and uh, they have a, a kind of a variety of models. They have some for very small children, um, and then some for teenagers, and then some maybe even kind of sports models, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're thinking about trying to get a, a whole circuit of, of this going. And <clears throat> something that, you know, works your, uh, works your, your, your body you know, differently than traditional bicycles do. Like I said, you can imagine riding a, a, a stair stepper instead of, you know, rotating a bike. Um, and, you know, Zyke to me is one of those, you know, when we were talking about watching things develop and what comes of it, um, Zyke could be the next big thing. I mean, it could be a significant company located here in Greenville that, you know, creates a market worldwide. Um, but none of us know that yet. So, you know, we'll watch it develop over time and try to surround it with the right things and kind of see how it develops. It is definitely, you know, one of those cross-cutting 
different ideas. And so far, they seem to have gotten a lot of good traction and headed in the right way. But you know, mobility is not just about you know cars and trains. I mean, it's about mobility. You know, bicycles and even walking. You know, to the extent that that's a you know part of our everyday experience, and it is a part of our experience. It, I mean, mobility is getting from where you are to where you want to go. So even all of us leaving here today, I mean, you know, we're going to walk to our vehicles before we, you know, before we get where we're going. So would, would the twill technology work? I mean, how adaptable is twill technology? Could they make tires for Zions? That's a good question. Well, I don't know that Zykes got inflated tires today. I mean, I would. Did, did they have it, so, the larger models have? Did have inflated small, tires, and the small ones are are, are, or are solid tires. Yeah. Um, you would you would imagine they could, um, and that would be a good example of crossing, you know, a major company with you know an entrepreneurial company. Zykes also an example of where. I think they produce in Asia today, and they're looking to actually bring some of that back to the United States so they can service the local market better. Yeah. Other, uh, other, other thoughts, questions? Last, last question. Well, last question. Know, it's not a question that was um, directed towards him. I just got news that I used to work with Zykes um, for advertising. We, were, we did their advertising. And I just got word that Zykes will be featured on The View. I don't watch The View, but I don't know what channel it's on. But um, on Friday, they'll be on The View for one of our channels. Is that our last? La last one. Yes, I have a question um, regarding the innovation. Um, I know you're heavily centered around innovation. I was <coughs> what your strategy is to address the fact that many larger companies are often resistant to um, innovation and change. Um, how you plan to um, promote these um, ideas and stuff to these guys? That, that's another presentation. Uh, there, Phil. We can come back next month and uh, talk about that one. Um, you know, the, sh the short to a very long answer is we've been working with major companies for about seven or eight years. You're exactly right. That is an issue. Okay, it's, it's them being open to the next big idea. It's also them being protective of uh, one, one of the things they're almost all concerned about is they're going to engage with an entrepreneur. Um, they are already working on a project. You know, they launch something into the marketplace and the entrepreneur sues them for stealing their idea. And from their perspective, you know, we've been working on this all along. Uh, so there's, there's, the, there's the resistance to being open to new things because, you know, we're focused on what we do today and, you know, let's, let's stick to our knitting and this is the business we're in. But then there's also the caution that says, let's be careful we don't get ourselves sued in this process. So one of the things InnoVenture does and InnoMobility will do, is we create a public space, right? So when you come and present something at a conference that we do or online, it is a public presentation, okay? And there's an art to that, right? I mean, you gotta, you gotta talk enough about what you're doing to attract customers, capital, talent, and technology, but not so much that you give away the secret sauce, right? And, and that's a balance, and it's a judgment call. And we've been doing that for a long time, both with big companies, with entrepreneurs. So we create this public space where everybody can engage, right? So when uh, Star Electric Vehicles came and presented at an in mobility segment of it, the InnoVenture Conference, and Duke Energy saw that, it was a safe space for both of them, right? They could, they could see each other. And then they could decide whether or not they wanted to engage, right? And, and, and Star couldn't say Duke stole my idea because by definition it was public, right? Um, and, and likewise, both of them needed to be careful, you know, not to say too much because it's public. Um, and the website's the same way. And so we think that's a core value of what we do in creating that public space where people can comfortably engage is important. It's also important that this is something that happens over time. We talked about three examples of companies that developed over a period of time. So quite frankly, even if had Frank and Frank Greer and Ralph Holzman and Michael Bullock had, had given away the secret sauce four or five years ago, quite frankly, they didn't know where they were going to ultimately end up. 
So I, personally, my experience is people get overly concerned about the really you know what's proprietary, and and these things develop over time in ways that that people can anticipate. So kind of getting them out there and getting them connected, you know, surrounding them by a rich ecosystem of resources so they can develop. That's that's what's the most important, and that's true whether the opportunity is inside a big organization. We talk a lot about high impact innovations right at the edge of organizations. And sometimes that's on the inside edge, you know, a new division uh, um, that was started just inside. We were at Blue Cross uh, last week or so, and we were talking about somebody that had started a, a company in medical tourism. You know, the ability to go to Bangkok and get medical care for 10% of what it would cost in the United States. Well, that's a new business, but it's inside, just inside the edge of Blue Cross. Hawaki is an example of an independent company just on the outside edge of Michelin, right? And so uh, we have lots of experience with it, and it's not easy. It's never easy. This is, you know, I often tell people don't try this at home. Um, but uh, it's, you're, you put your finger on, I think, the, the, the real important issue that we need to figure out how, how, how to overcome it. We're really going to grow, you know, innovation in the community as a whole. Well, thank you very much for listening, and uh, we'll be hanging around. We have several InnoVenture people here, uh, Jessica Moss and Jeff Servi and Butler Mullins. If you've got any other questions of us, we'd love to see you Friday and, you know, and some of the uh, you know, subsequent things we got coming up in the next several months. Thank you very much. Yeah, round of applause for